am into this without my me. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to our webinar today. Behind the scenes, a closer look at email headers for better doability. Um, yeah, welcome today to the session today. We have our experts Jan from Kickbooks and Sebastian, our technical lead from the CSA. They will guide you through the basics of the email headers and their impact on your email campaigns. Briefly to my person, my name is Maike and I'm responsible for the marketing and the events and especially for the CSA live webinars. And I'm here today for your support uh, in the background. I will answer your questions um, about the tool or the questions during the webinar. I'm here for your support today. And who's the CSA? It's always a good question. Um, our goal is to increase the quality of commercial emailing. We act as a neutral interface between mailbox providers and senders of commercial emailing. We establish legal and technical quality standards in cooperation with our partners and, of course, our CSA certified senders. The adoption of these quality standards um, is a part of our certification of, and, of course, our certification process. And if you want to get more information about the CSA and all the things we can do for you, um, just contact us after the webinar and we will get back to you and give you everything you need to know about the CSA. And as you can see, we have partners. We are grateful to have the Martian Harlon and Kickbox on board for the live webinars this year. Thank you for your huge support during the year. And dear attendees, if you want to get more information about the Martian Harlon or Kickbox or all of them, just download the partner booklet. It should be in the download section on the right on your screen and find out about what they do and um, how you can contact them. And we have some housekeeping words. Um, please note you're muted during the webinar. Of course, you can ask your questions and we have two options for you. You can ask your questions live by raising your hand or you can use the chat function and submit your questions to organizer. And um, yeah, I will read out your questions out loud or Sebastian, we will see, but um, feel free to ask everything you want to know about email headers. Um, we have a challenge. We would be glad if you share your key facts, your learnings or takeaways about the webinar today on social media, just tag us and uh, use our hashtag and uh, we would be glad to see something you learned today on social media today. And now, um, I'm happy to um, give the moderation rights to Sebastian. So Jen and Sebastian, you can start and you will hear me at the end again and uh, wish you a lot of fun today. Yeah. It should work, or do you have the right, Sebastian? Um, yes, Great. I, okay. I do. So first of all, 
I think everyone can hear me. And uh, before I share my screen, welcome, Jen. Hello. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you on the webinar uh, for the CSA. And um, it is it is funny that by luck, I found out that um, you are the one who wrote a four step blog post series about email headers. And uh, this is basically uh, the idea why we had a chat uh, during mock to say, hey, you know, let's talk about email headers. Um, not deeply from the deliverability perspective, um, because all us, the deliverability geeks, know the headers and they know how to read headers. Um, but there are always the questions from the deliverability managers to their brand contacts to the email marketing managers. Hey, we need support. Do, we need to set up DMARC for you or we need to set set up DKIM for you. Or did you think about setting up a subdomain that we use for sending? And maybe email marketers sit there and say, I've got no clue what you're talking about. So that was my intention. Jen, would you do us the favor, um, introduce yourself and uh, let us know what was the motivation to get on that topic as well. Yeah, definitely. Hi, I'm Jen. Uh, I work at Kickbox. I lead up the consulting branch. Um, and the motivation for the articles, not to lie, they're a little long, but you know, I had an intention of writing one. And then you just keep going and you're like, oh, but I could talk about this and I can talk about this. And it blew up into this four article series. But the intent came from there's so much that you learn from your peers, from working with um, clients and troubleshooting and even at MOG. And it becomes second nature. And I was like, I'd like to teach people about it and why they're so important and how they can actually do stuff on their own as well. So maybe not solve every problem, but maybe use it to help it understand more about their program and the infrastructure, help them understand why everything you put in your email matters. And it's not about, is it capital or not, but what is in there and what are your end users seeing and what are you setting expectations for? How are you training them? All of those pieces and, and why sometimes we ask the questions that we do and why domains matter so much. And, all the little pieces because your end user, which is really the most important part for an email marketer, they're heavily impacted, but also you've got the spam filter appliances, the mailbox providers, they're looking at everything too, and they see all of the details. So from an end customer point of view, they may not see a problem, but a mailbox provider does. So understanding that there's a lot more going on behind the scenes can help, uh, I think a marketer at least find an area to start troubleshooting or understand like we have a gap that needs to be fixed. Right. That makes sense. And that was exactly the same uh, motivation for me as well. We, 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 we've we got different parties involved there and everyone under, uh, needs to understand their different responsibilities. And to a certain extent, everyone can influence email marketing success. I'm not talking only about deliverability, I'm talking about email mm -hmm. marketing success because deliverability is just a part and the branding. And um, I hope the attendees already see my, um, my, my, my shared screen because what I already opened is my, my secret sauce. This is my very private inbox. So this is, <laughs> you now have my private email address. Um, and um, Jennifer and me, we, we, we're thinking about how to structure that webinar and we thought, hey, you know, we can do it with a with a boring PowerPoint uh, presentation, but the way we use email is in our in inboxes. And uh, this is how um, you can discover your emails. So the idea is now that Jen and me, we simply run through that inbox and talk about a few things. Um, and we start with the, yeah, EV things. Um, and then we go step by step deeper, and uh, we will find you. Uh, we will show you that uh, you'll find the different elements in different ways, and and how they link together, and how to understand and how to read them. Um, and uh, we hope that everyone on the end takes a little bit out of that webinar. And uh, so let's jump in. Let's jump into it here. So it is German example. So it is German language. Um, but that doesn't matter because what we are going through 
is text off anyway a little bit. Um, this is Gmail how you may know it. Um, a little different in your setup, but um, you may already, oh, what you're already seeing here are header parts. And um, the easy thing to explore and to jump into an email is uh, kind of first things if you just run and scroll down your inbox. And Jen, you, you, had, a, you had a great example um, on your mobile phone when you were running through, um, through, through your inbox. Maybe you can uh, show it to the camera. I don't know if yeah. everyone see it. Let me just stop sharing my screen. I so we were that. talking about um, with the headers and what's so important and a lot of what marketers do, you decide that friendly from what do people want to see as my brand name and then the address associated with it. And so um, I looked at my spam folder, if you can see it, there's a lot of brand names in there. And the takeaway is that none of them are real. <laughs> and so that's a huge part of understanding email headers is how can someone put my brand information when it's not theirs? And so it goes into how email works, but all the little fine pieces that are there and then why we have authentication and where, how it all ties together and how it's all seen in the headers. Um, right. But you know, like if, when I look at it, they have Kohl's, your confirmation number. I didn't order anything from Kohl's. Um, they have stuff from uh, credit bureau and ADT and none of those, I have information with normally Ninja Air Fryer. There's tons of stuff in here. I'm like, none of this is related to, to me. But, you know, if you go in your own spam folder, don't open anything necessarily, but you'll see what's going on. So imagine if somebody else is trying to use your brand name and in your domain, an end customer may not know, but that's why there's all these other pieces that we're going to ask and talk about that the mailbox providers know and see, and they can use to help end users say, I'm going to put this in spam because I don't really believe this is legitimate and I want to protect my customers from engaging with something that might be phishing or something nefarious. Right. That's absolutely correct. And um, that's where the tasks of a deliverability manager and the brand manager on the, on the sending brand side starts because it's all related to the setup. Um, the stricter, I just wrote it in a, in, a, in a blog article I'm preparing today. Uh, the stricter your decisions and setup on email authentication is the less misuse of your domain or tricking your end customers or your end users as possible. And um, when you're setting up new emails or you want to want to want to analyze emails that you receive into your inbox you basically should do it exactly the same like your end user does um and um just using gmail here as an example but all the other mailbox providers have exactly the same you don't need to be a tech nerd and go into source code in the first hand you get the most important information already in this kind of rough overview so easy to read and human readable um, summary of elements from the email header so um what we and clearly as, see yeah jen i was just gonna say and as an email sender because not most um, end users may not know what any of these things are but as an email marketer you do actually know what some of them are but there's known by different things so you know you're friendly from and you're from address with the, your domain but then down below you'll see signed by and mailed by and your mailed by is your spf those are the things that your deliverability consultants say please go set up and your signed by is your dkim domain and signature and if you don't see those things when you're quickly checking in gmail they either failed or they weren't included. Um, so those are really quick things that you can say, oh, okay, at least everything there is signing and looks good. That's right. And that's what I meant with the stricter you are, the less and the, the smaller are the gaps for, some, so for someone to misuse your whole email traffic. And this is a pretty good example because here there is no gap in between. This is we call it the 100% alignment. We see that 
email.babymark.de is used as the friendly from, and it's as well set up as the sender from address. And it's also signed by using this domain. So this is nearly down to perfect. And you can also see um, babymarked.de, so the main brand domain is used here as well in the reply to address. And it is a valid one. It is nl-antwort, which is nl reply, um, because what I hate as well is and some spammers and sorry, legit brands, legitimate brands do it as well. They use things like no reply at, but to me, this is spamming behavior. So email marketing is a, is a, is a, is a communication tool and communication always works both ways. And uh, it already starts me thinking about, okay, is that a reliable service if someone is using a no reply at brand.com address? Why does that need to happen? And, uh, but as you can see here, it's, branded it is using the same domain and what you see here as well it is also encrypted so even the transmission that your esp your email service provider is using and open up the connection to the mailbox provider is encrypted so um it is sent through a secured tunnel and this is important because there also parts of content or the, this, the way of sending can be influenced by hackers uh, and can be misused. And um, so these are the obvious signs and things um, that can be uh, checked by you and uh, can be verified by you. I've got another example. Yeah, and I was oh, just yeah. gonna add everything that you see there, for example. And just to step back, if you're not 100% sure where email headers are, they're, they're the additional conversation uh, information. It's in their information and it's shared from the sending server to whomever they're mailing to. And it has a lot more detail that we'll quickly touch on or in a little bit. But, you know, I think of headers and I wrote about this in the blog article are very much like a copyright page. They have all the information about the book you're about to read and who right. to contact, who did what. And so when you look at this stuff, you're telling customers reply to nl.antwort, blah, blah, blah. And so if you're providing that information, the expectation is that that information will work. So something that can easily trip up marketers is that an, a reply doesn't work, that the mailbox wasn't set up, something like that. So when you start to set your campaigns up, if, especially if you're migrating to a new vendor, if something is displayed to your customers, test and make sure that it works. Can you email to it? Or are you going to get a bounce back? Because the bounce back um, could create a negative experience, especially if in your email you're saying mail to so-and-so, or if you're asking for replies. And even though it says no reply, you know what? People are still going to reply. So you should have some type of working mailbox that at least responds if you need to send them to a different customer service address or, or department. Right showing you another example, which is not that aligned. So this is, the, if you ask me, a best practice example. Mm -hmm. And to me, my personal opinion, every email should look like that. Looking into another example, this looks different, but it's valid as well. Um, so it is just a different type of um, setup using a different ESP, for example, but you, as you can see, it uh, shows the same. You have, uh, you, you know the friendly from, um, you know where it's sent from. This is the system. As you can see, this is already a bit more encrypted. So um, if you're not a tech guy and you're just a, a, a normal end user, you will not understand what this is about. And you will also not understand what this is about. You may not even understand what the signature of an email is, but it looks more suspicious to you. But this is also valid, and um, okay. we can we, we will come to it right now because I would love to go a step deeper, if that's okay with you, Jan, as well. Yes, the only have? thing I'll add to this before we go that next step is you have the via, and I'm not going to pronounce that because I'll probably butcher it, but the via gmail.mcsv.net. Um, 
And so as an end user, and I even get this from many clients, why do I have this via here? It's confusing. It, it might create, a, you know, people might not trust it. And that's because you don't have that alignment. You don't have a DKIM signature that's matching the friendly from address. And so you'll see the actual DKIM signature is what's showing for the via um, up at the top when somebody, if, if they don't open up this little blurb that gives you the kind of shortcut to headers, they're going to see that and might question it. Or your um, other marketing managers or whomever is receiving this might say, why is that there? And that's because your authentication is not branding to the point where it aligns with what you're telling your customers. So I look, I think of that as like an ID. If I go up to the door and I say, hey, my name's Jen, but my driver's license says I'm Martha, they don't match up. Um, so it's all about matching who you're claiming to be with who your actual identity is. Right. This. Uh, thanks for pointing that out. Um, because what is happening here is because of the missing alignment. So again, align would mean that we that we get uh, that we pick up veyastrandcamping.dk again and use it for signing domain uh, for sending domain and signing domain. But the alignment hasn't been in place. But what the email service provider does in the back end is they make sure that their setting is properly or that their settings is properly set up for every sender um, because mailbox providers um, expect authentication being set up correctly. Um, but as you can see from a technical point of view, and we will go deeper in a second, um, it is valid, but for the end user, it looks strange. So that's why here again, the recommendation always is as an email marketer, take your time, sit down, think about alignment, think about the different domains within an email, and we come to it in a second, um, and provide your ESP all the information he requests from you. If he asks you for a subdomain for mass email purposes only, give it to him. <laughs> and in an ideal case, delegate it to him because those guys will manage the setup for you. And then it may not look like this. It will more look like this. It will not have a send wire and it will be 100% aligned. So if you ask me just from the outside perspective, this looks much nicer mm -hmm. than this one. But this yeah, is also I compliant. That's correct. And and that's something that another reason that kind of went into me writing the article is, and especially being part of MOG, is there's so much abuse out there. It it baffles me to the point where I tell everyone, I want to burn my computer when I get home. <laughs> and so I, you know, I think about that a lot is like all the things I'm learning and I'm in the industry, I can't imagine all the stuff that people are not um, aware of who don't deal with it daily or have conversations you know, co conferences about it. And so I think about the headers a lot that if we can educate more and let people know, like you as a marketer want to know, but also go home and tell your family, hey, here are some other things to look in your email to make sure you don't get fished because mm -hmm. this stuff is happening. Now it can still easily happen. But in, in the sense of the question may come up of before, how can someone use my brand and my domain? Well, technically when you're sending an email that from Two, those are all just text fields that you're sending through and they can be anything. And so that's why we have authentication that's not just SPF and DKIM and it's gone to DMARC because DMARC is that next step that says, if I'm gonna use your domain in a way that an end user is gonna see, who's probably not gonna look at the email headers, I need to make sure that it also matches all the other methods that I'm using to authenticate who this came from and that it's, um, still in the same format it was when it left the system and hasn't been compromised. And so those are the little pieces and why I think email headers are so important just to get people also to start looking a little bit more closely at what's coming in and what's authenticated and how it's being claimed and, and pushed out there. Right. And what's the impression that it's creating in front of the end customer, right? Um, right. An end customer could also already be, I mean, a little bit doubting on that. I can't even read those domains. So I don't know if that's secure. Um, so the closer to the branding and the more aligned, the better. 
Um, and and that, go ahead, sorry. No, that's fine. I don't want I was to interrupt say, you. Go ahead. That, that's where like the cousin domains, when we talk about what a you know, marketer should know, that's why right. they're so dangerous because an end user may not realize that that cousin domain is not yours. So if you start to use them, you're training them to look for variations of your domain and why when Sebastian said, if someone says use a subdomain, that's why you use it. If you if you can't mail with your corporate domain or it's not recommended and a subdomain is an option, do that. Don't use a cousin domain because again, your customer will see it. It might be legitimate for you, but then if someone's trying to spoof you and they get it, instead of let's say you do email dash right. uh, baby mark, and then they, they know that they might now just send mail dash and they easily can start to spoof and make themselves look even closer to who you are because now you've trained your customer trained your customer to say cousin domains are okay. They don't know that. They just know that it's coming in a very similar format. That's correct. Um, I just, this week, no, last week, I had that that, that discussion with, uh, we use brand-service.net as an alternative sending domain to our brand domain. Yes, but this, to an end user, they don't know anything about the techniques. Um, so it may be suspicious um, already because they know brand.com, but brand dash whatever dot com um, is strange. Micah, there's a question from the <laughs> audience, I guess. <laughs> um, I will read the question out loud. If you yes. send from a shared IP versus dedicated, what does the mail by say? Um, it doesn't matter. The we can see some of it in the headers if you want to dive in to show a little right. bit more. Right, which makes may make sense. So uh, let me just. It's a great transition options. question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the segue, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a good. It, it, that that's a good point. Um, what I've done here, it's already prepared. But in that tab, you always have the possibility to have a closer look into the source code of an email. It depends on the mailbox provider, but all mailbox providers on such a label like show the originals, show the source code, show me the, the email source code or whatever um, is possible. So you can click on that and then such uh, an overview, maybe just looking like that, or like here in the Gmail example, a little more um, yeah, summarized and easy to read will be shown up. In that case, um, we see. So I'm coming back to the shared question to the shared IP uh, uh, question. I'm, I'm I'm not forgetting about it um, because IP is is a good is a good point here. What you see basically is again an extraction of the data um, that we uh, saw from the first view, but here it already comes together or down to the authentication pieces, like what um, Jen already said. Um, you can protect your brand domain with different authentication methods, and you can protect um, email sending with using basically these three methods, which is sender policy framework. And this is where it comes down to the IP address. So this IP address is the one I received that newsletter from. Um, I only get the newsletter from one specific IP, but it could be that the domain email.babymark.de is set up on a shared IP pool. Um, so it could be that Jen already also got the same campaign from email.babymark.de, but the chunk of emails that have been planned to send out went through a completely different IPs because the email service provider manages, for example, to send out different chunks of email on parallel to different IPs using different connections to the mailbox providers out there. And that's why um, it could either be that several IPs are used at the same time or just one dedicated IP. So basically, Jan, correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't matter if it's a shared IP or a dedicated IP. The headers are always looking the same in that way, and it doesn't impact the deliverability or um, yeah, the, 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 the inboxing in general. 
So I'll, I'll just add to that a little bit because I, I, I agree. It, it doesn't matter in terms of how your headers display. Um, your shared IP could impact things if your shared IP doesn't have a good reputation. But That's if you're true. dedicated, it doesn't have a good reputation that will impact things as well. And so something you'll see, and I don't, if you go into the actual headers, in some cases, depending on how your ESP sets you up, um, probably one of the first received lines, um, you'll actually see the IP. And so you'll see the host name and hello there. And if they match, at least Gmail will do that and the, the PTR. Um, and the PTR is here's my IP. If I go and look up what domain is associated with it, and then I take that domain and look up the IP, do they match? Um, just because there's a lot of spoofing around that stuff too, because spammers like to put good domains in their headers. And so sometimes they'll do that, but then when you actually do the lookups, you're like, that actually doesn't match. And <laughs> that domain wasn't actually tied to that IP. Um, so if you're using a shared IP, Sometimes what you'll see is something like shared dot. It all depends on how the ESP names the host and all that stuff. But some dedicated IPs also have the actual client's name. It all depends on how they want to work the DNS. So in some cases, you can pick through and see it. Um, but also, it can be difficult because um, DNS work can be hard to manage. So you may not understand if it's shared or not, but you also may. It really depends on the provider and how they go through the technical settings. Right, and just I just did it on parallel um, to to uh, just give you an impression how that works in the back end. So I just had a look into the SPF and in theory, all these IPs that are listed in the SPF record are allowed to send that campaign. So, and, and exactly to that point, what, what Jen said, it is rather the question of how does deliverability on a shared IP pool impact different brands using the same IPs, or do you want to choose a dedicated one and you're, you're responsible for your own uh, reputation? So, if you do strange things, you're responsible for your own stuff. Um, and working on a, on a shared pool, if a brand, independently from you does strange things it impacts you so that's a decision there so it's a reputation based decision um have that talk to your mailbox provider um it doesn't mean shared ips are bad or dedicated ips are the best um i prefer dedicated ips because i uh prefer to to be responsible and uh, hold myself accountable for the stuff and maybe bad things i do um but that's a discussion you can have with your um email service provider there and, and something back. you can uh, really quick if, something you can think about when you look at your headers and you see your ip if you don't know if it's shared or if it's dedicated um you know talk to your provider your esp about what you're using if, if you're not sure if, it, if it's not obvious through the host name and all that stuff but something else you can ask, like when you actually look up your SPF for your sending domain, so in this example, example email.babymark.de, if that SPF points to a wide range of IPs, like what Sebastian just showed, that's another question you can ask your provider. Are you giving us too much movement? So if somebody else gets on their system and starts mailing with your domain, your SPF will pass, even if you didn't even set up that account. If for some reason they, they're able to use the infrastructure in another way, you're, you're, you now have a very forgiving SPF policy because you've listed the provider's full range of IPs. It doesn't necessarily mean that's a bad thing because providers do that so that if they need to change out IPs for some reason, they can easily do so. But it's a question to ask, is like how protected is your system um, as well? And now I'm starting to go off on a tangent. So I'll stop there, but it's just something to keep in mind as you start to put all these pieces together. Well, here's my IP, interesting. Okay, and there's my SPF record. How do they tie together and how many other IPs are allowed to send on my behalf? Am I using shared? Am I using dedicated? What should my restrictions be? I'm going to pause. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can spend the whole night. That's not an issue for me at all. <laughs> you know, and then listen to you for the whole night. No worries. What I would love to do here, I mean, I already jumped into, it looks really dry and maybe really boring here. Uh, this is pure source code uh, from the email header. Um, and if you scroll through that email header, you may, you may think, oh, come on, guy, I don't really get anything out of it. And to be very honest, 
I also can't explain everything and every single bit here. I don't know if you can, Jan. Um, but the point is, what are the most important and most common things you should look at? And we already touched on something, which is authentication. This is where it all starts with. So that whole IP, shared IP, dedicated IP, domain alignment, uh, subdomain usage, and all these kind of terms and, and, and topics are related to a very fundamental thing that needs to be happen first when it comes to sending emails and receiving email. It is authentication. And the authentication is all about, am I the one that I am saying I'm the one? And the mailbox provider wants to prove that. And the majority of mailbox providers provide a kind of protocol in the email header. So when you receive a suspicious email and you're not sure, I don't know the domain, or if, I, if, if we look into that example here, the domains look very different to each other. Is that legitimate? Is, is, is that reliable? Is that, can I trust that? Have a look in the source code, go down, through the um, authentication results. And there you get the summary. And all you need to look at is DKIM, one, the authentication method, does it pass? Did Google say, okay, that passes? Even if it's the kind of different looking domain, it does pass. Here's a second DKIM signature included, but it also passes. The SPF, what we've just mentioned, is the IP address allowed, this IP address in that case, allowed to send through that email server by using the, uh, the, 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 the specific sending domain? Yes, it is because it is SPF passing as well. Um, so the both authentication methods are passed here. So Google proved from a technical point of view, and we're just down to the technical level here, everything's fine. And Google validates, okay, there is no risk for the end user. And that's why the email potentially ends up where it has to end up in the inbox. What we see well, in this I, example. I would sorry, say authentication ready? doesn't take away risk. I think there can still be risk. Right. Spammers can authenticate. But all they're able to prove is with DKIM, this domain signed the message and it's intact when I received it. And that this system is saying, is allowing, um, this domain is allowing the system to mail on their behalf. But if the content's questionable, authentication can't touch on that part. And that's where the spam filters come in and all that other good stuff. Exactly to that point, because that's the difference here between these two examples. In that example, the as we can see, there is no brand domain anywhere. We only see the brand domain in the from. But as Jan already said, this from could be it is a free text field in e in the email protocol and can be used for everything from everyone. So we need to have a trust in here uh, in, in in the email service provider that the service provider really know uh, or, or knew um who has been the one setting up that email and sent in the name of a strand camping and that's why from a technical point of view this is valid and that's what google is just validating the better example is this one this is the visible from address where is it there is the visible from address and it is email babymark.com and as jan said risk is everywhere but i all I also edit and said, the more aligned, the stricter I, I am, the less potential is, less, is left to misuse. So here, as we can see, the DKIM signature passes on exactly the same domain, which means the domain setup in the backend has been made on that domain. And the SPF validates on the same domain as well. And what has been in place here, which, call, which is called DMARC, let me just mark that, uh, which is called DMARC, is a very nice example of being under control 
in communication to the mailbox provider what should happen if one of the above mentioned authentication methods is not working. This is just saying, please reject that message if it doesn't match to email.babymark.com in any case, which means the email doesn't even end up in the inbox. There is, for the real geeky nerd, uh, spammers, there's still ways to, to do that, but it's really hard. It, it's, a, it's the highest barrier at the moment. Um, you can influence as a brand and um, uh, a, a best practice following email service provider to set up email authentication and using DMARC as a reporting protocol to say what's going to happen with that email if someone is misusing my domain in my name. Am I correct, Jen? I hope. <laughs> I think you covered it. <laughs> I do want to touch on quickly some other headers because we, I, we, you know, heavily talked about authentication, how you find it in header, headers. We talked about how there's text fields that can be manipulated however you want, um, but they're also very legitimate, like the from and the to, and that's what you see. But an, another field that I love to look at, and again, I am an email geek, so maybe others won't, but the received. Um, the received header is so important. So every time the message passes from one server to the next, they have the choice to like timestamp it essentially. And so as a user, if you go from the bottom to the top, you're following that email's path to say from the start to finish, where did it go? And so as a marketer, if you're ever wondering, why did it take this email three hours to get to me when everybody else took an hour? You can look at all of the received and there's a couple tools. I think Google has a, a message header analyzer. If you Google that, it'll pop it up. Um, and it will pull out the timestamps. So you can say, oh, from this server to this one, it was one second. From this server to this server, it was two seconds. And then you might come to one where let's say you were mailing to Microsoft and somebody also had um, a security appliance in there. You could say there was like a 10 minute gap or, or longer. And you can start to see, oh, the delay wasn't even on the sending side. It was on the receiving side. They held it for an hour or two before they released it to me. And so those are, are really, you don't have to know all of the details in there other than just look at the timestamp. And when you hop from one received to the next, you can start to see, and then you can see when it's delivered. You can see um, according to the date, if it was um, entered in legitimately, you can see the intent of when it was supposed to leave the system versus when it was actually received. How close are they? And then you can start to find the gaps. Um, but those are really informative too, that you can pull some information from and try to figure out, oh, on, internally, we need to figure out why our own mail is getting delayed this much or something like that. Thanks for mentioning that, uh, Jen. That does make sense. And the example I just pulled out here isn't a good one because we don't have so many received uh, lines in here. But that's exactly the, a good point. And that's already um, an insight and a tool, a helpful tool for, for every email marketer out there um, who feels, I would love to have a look over the shoulder of my ESP and my deliverability manager. I trust them, but I, I also want to understand and get to know what's going on. Because what what happens, and that's 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 in res, for me in the responsibility of the um, email marketer as well. They should receive their own newsletters in a free mailer's tech, uh, inbox, for example. And um, what should be done occasionally is checking, for example, the authentication results. Um, because it could happen. Mistakes can happen everywhere. And, you know, even uh, also deliverability managers are just humans. And uh, the scripts that are doing the setup could also be, uh, or can do mistakes, which is possible. Um, and when just the responsible email marketing manager checks, okay, it passes. Or when, here, when, when, we, when you see a fail, reach out to your deliverability manager and tell them, hey, I see at Google that the DKIM is failing. Is there something going wrong? And I bet that the deliverability manager on your ESP side is saying, oh, come on, thank you very much for absorbing it. It should be our job for sure, and they will monitor that, but it's really hard to monitor thousands of friends on payroll. But if you reach out to them, it's quick for them to, 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 uh, um, to resolve it. And the other hand is, 
also, um, you need to understand that deliverability managers are able to manage your deliverability to a certain extent. But um, when authentic, even to what Jen said, even if authentication is passing, um, when you have high aggressive sales content, or you're sending on parallel to your 10 other competitors who are also sending, for example, Black Friday. Black Friday, completely madness. Everyone is sending every single ad sign in a database out there to the mailbox providers. And the mailbox providers just see, Woo, there's a thunderstorm coming up. I can already see a billion uh, or billions of um, emails coming in and yeah, I do have spare servers, but I need to manage them. And uh, to the point that Jen just said, look at the received timestamp. It could happen that they accept email and then they still need to validate, is the content not spammy? Is it of interest for the receivers? So all that filtering mechanism is running and it could take time. And depending on the load, um, I mean, mailbox providers are only humans as well, to some extent. And the servers have also limited capacity. Um, and that's where it happens. And delays of email campaigns could be. And that's a good point. And you can question it um, looking at the timestamps. And so you have a little control and you can help your deliverability manager by looking at this. Some of the other ones too is list unsubscribe. I believe that one example you have pulled up. If you look at your email headers, you don't have list unsubscribe, ask your mailbox provider or your ESP, can I get one? This is, I love this particular one for a couple reasons. Um, one in your Gmail, um, Yahoo mailboxes, for example, they have a nice little unsubscribe um, next to it. And so, it's so easy, we hear from many people, hitting the complaint button, it's just easy, it's right there, why not? But if you have a way to quickly unsubscribe without scrolling to the bottom, because most marketers love to put the unsubscribe at the bottom, um, it's an easy way for them to say, I'm gonna remove myself without having them be like, oh, spam. Because people like efficiency. You know, I even think about my my stuff personally. I'm like, if it's not easy, I'm probably not gonna do it. Or I'm not, I'm gonna, you know, take my time before I get to it. So an email is overloaded. So for customers, they're going to want to be quick. They want it done and out of the way. So provide that list on subscribe. But it's also, and I've heard mailbox providers say, it's a way to help protect your reputation. One, because you can help reduce complaints. But if you look at Yahoo's mail app, for example, at the bottom of a message, and I'll see if I can find it here to, to find an example, you'll see um, a big button that says unsubscribe. They make it pretty clear for you. So you don't have to dig through things. And so they have a whole subscription management page where you can go in and see all the mailers that are sending to you. And then you can say, I wanna unsubscribe. And they, the way they are able to do it is through list unsubscribe. Mm -hmm. So if you make it easy, you're less likely to have an elevation of complaints, which will hurt your deliverability. Unsubscribes will not. It's, it's an easy way to just maintain your list and keep it healthy and um, those are the customers that are really interactive uh, with your brand. So I'll, I'm going to see really quick if I find an example. I don't know if you have anything else you want to add with the list unsubscribe. Not really, to be honest. Uh, uh, to be honest, because that was already a great uh, summary. I can only add on um, the mailbox providers' feedback. So I'm, I'm dealing with the partnerships um, with with our mailbox providers, and exactly to that, the mailbox providers request the list unsubscribe header to also reduce server load. So the mailbox providers say it is easier for us to provide and parse a list unsubscribe link and showcase it to the user than processing um, a spam complaint and um, burning down reputation. Um, and I already said that we're talking about a communication tool here. And communication is also always two sides. So if someone wants to uh, to leave your list, let him go. If this this person, this contact, is still interested in your brand brand's activities, 
they may use a different communication channel. I don't know what your offer, uh, social media or any chat, chat functionality or whatever. Uh, it doesn't always mean that um, you shouldn't leave them because you lose a customer or you lose a contact. Maybe it's just, no, they're not prefer preferring the email communication channel anymore. Um, so make it easy and protect your reputation or protect the reputation on the other brands using the same shared IPs for sending. So mm -hmm. it's your responsibility. And this is how the uh, list unsubscribe header uh, is looking like from the source code. It's including a link or it's a mail to function. Yep, and the list unsubscribe post on one click is what really helps. So like in, in this particular example, there's a lot of text here and I have big fingers. So, you know, just clicking on these tiny links is maybe not feasible, but at the very yeah. bottom, the there's the, yeah, the unsubscribe yeah. at the bottom. That's right. from the one click. And so, you know, in this particular example, it's not terribly clear where to, I mean, I can see it at the bottom, but um, I have my glasses on. What if I don't? <laughs> or I have a big <laughs> finger and I don't click the right one. So, you know, it, it enables the mailbox providers to make UI enhancements for the end user because those are their customers. And right. so they're giving senders the ability to enhance their emails. Um, and this is one way to do it is through the header. Um, and there's many other features and coding stuff that's out there to help, you know, improve your emails. But they're constantly working to say, how can I help my customers? How can I make things easy for them? Because they want a positive, healthy environment. And how do I also make it obvious how to complain if this really is egregious? But then how do I protect those good senders who just need a little bit of help getting their customers to remove themselves in a, a, a healthy way, to break up friendly, so to speak? <laughs> that's right. Yes. I mean, do we have some questions from the audience? Because to, I mean, we could spend the whole night talking about that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're not, we're not really done here yet. Um, but I hope we touched on the on on, on the main things that are mm -hmm. email marketers and the. And the um... Yeah, the one thing in my notes that I forgot to mention with the friendly from, because it, it seems like it's a clear cut and dry, like this is an easy way to do your friendly from, make sure it's super clear that it's branded. So for example, and I was talking to Sebastian about this, um, I had signed up uh, for something with a company and I got a confirmation email. And the confirmation was just TBK. And I was like, oh, this is junk. I was about to hit spam. Now I'm an aggressive complainer. Not everyone is, I would just delete, but I love to just complain if I, if I feel like it's suspicious. I had no idea who this email was from. And for some reason I did decide to open it. And thankfully I did because it was my confirmation email that I needed. But had I marked it, deleted or marked it spam, I would have no record of this purchase that I made or this you know, event that we scheduled. And so the, the learning from that is as a sender, don't use acronyms, make sure it's clear who you are. If you are branded on your website as you know, selling com or computer mania, your friendly from should probably be computer mania. And I know there's a lot of discussions about, do I want to make this personal? Do I make myself, like, do I put my personal name, you know, Jen at Kickbox? You can test those things, but really think about your end user. What do they expect from you and the type of communication? So once I start emailing someone one-on-one, -on -one, yes, it should say my name. But if I'm getting a marketing message, I want it to be from the company because essentially that's who I'm communicating with. And where's the need to cover any branding name or domain name? I mean, um, the subscriber subscribed to the newsletter service on purpose using a specific domain, typed it in the browser, went to the newsletter uh, web form, typed in uh, the email address, and they still have the name of the brand and the domain in hand. Um, and also, um, not just the domain, also the human readable name. And uh, so this should be repetitive in all points of an email header, in all domains, in everything that's visible for the end user, and as well as we saw uh, for the deliverability, for the deliver di different deliverability purposes as well. Um, because yeah, I'm repeating myself, the stricter you are, 
um, the better your email success will be at the very end. Right. If you are interested in have a summary of what we've just talked about, then there are four articles of you <laughs> on the Kickbox blog. Um, I like that. I enjoyed that read. It was a real great read. I can only recommend to go there and uh, take a great glass of wine, your <laughs> iPad, <laughs> switch off TV and have a read through the blog articles. I and pull up that. an email and, and follow along. <laughs> Right, exactly to that point. That's that's what I had in mind, and that was my impression reading through your uh, articles. It was a great step-by-step -step instruction where to find it, and you can really do it on 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 parallel on parallel life. And uh, yeah, I think we're done, aren't we, Michael? Yes. Uh, at the moment, we don't have any questions, but maybe the next days, or yeah. You can raise your questions during the next day. Contact Jen directly or Sebastian. And uh, first of all, I want to thank Jen for your time and of course, sharing your knowledge with us today. And of course, thank you, Sebastian, too, for your time today. And um, yeah, the attendees, that's it for today. Uh, keep an eye on our website or on our LinkedIn profile for the for the webinars. I think we will have one at the end of April. Stay tuned and thank you for your time today and have a nice day. Thank you again. Bye. Thanks, Jen. Bye, everyone. Yep.